Good morning. We are on this. Uh, we are on a, um, a subject here called hashtag difficulties following Jesus in a selfie centered world. And we've been looking at how technology is uh, really interfering with our relationship between Jesus and God and each other. And in that, uh, how uh, something so amazing can help us is also interfering with our relationship with each other. And then that we're finding out a lot of things about ourselves that, uh, no, no selfies today. My flashlight's on. It's distracting, isn't it? Cool. See what I mean? How it can cause the problems. Well, what we're going to look at today in our, our, our um, difficulties that we're having is in compassion. Um, technology is um, usually a cause of, of issues in our lives of declining compassion to each other. Uh, when, one of the things that we're looking at is in, uh, if you can maybe recall uh, how insensitive we're really becoming. Um, in 2012, there was a guy that uh, he, his name was Coney, and he was uh, uh, this reporter was following his story on a rebellion um, issue that he was having in Gu Guarla, the guerrilla warfare there. But as soon as the some hard times fell on the reporter, then you never heard anything more of the story about this guy. Um, then in uh, 2014, maybe some of you remember the ALS uh, bucket water, cold, what is it, that bucket the water challenge, you know, where you dump cold water, ice bucket challenge, yeah, you know. I mean, that, I, and really when you take back of the research of it and look at it, it only lasted probably about five weeks. It was just really hot, you know. I mean, they might have, ALS probably made a little bit of money from that challenge, you know, because it brought some kind of awareness there. You know, but in, in the in reality, is it just was a short-lived term because then people just like, I don't care about ALS, you know. And then there was a, the thought of an, um, and also in 2014, there was a real big uprise in the, some uh, uh, 200 Nigerian little uh, schoolgirls came up missing. That only lasted for a little while, and then it went away. But new on horizon, we have something we can really look forward to in technology, is the mannequin challenge. I researched it, and what's it for? It's just the challenge. <laughs> There's nothing good. There's no benefit of money or anything else out of it. It's just a challenge to see who has the best mannequin video. And you know what? And the way it's going to go, it's not going to last very long because it takes a lot of time and energy to get a bunch of people together to be still so a guy can go around there and then they add music to it. You know, it, it's technology has just put us into a place of, of that, that our compassion for each other has declined in, in a tr dramatic way. Um, the University of Michigan did a comprehensive study of 14,000 college students in the year between 1979 and 2009. In this, they found that there was a decline in empathy. For some of us, we're going to ask the question, what is empathy? Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another, one another. So in that, there was a decline. From, from the 1979 until 1980, it declined 40%. So just in that short little time right there, there's a 40% drop. So in that, what is it the percentage now that we just don't care about each other? See, we care 40% less than people did in the 1980s. Then how much more of it really is it right now? That we just scroll through our phones and we just kind of just like, eh, whatever, you know. And really, somebody's heart's pouring out, and their heart is really being broken. But in the statistics of what um, this, this uh, questions between these 14,000 people, here are some of the questions that they were being asked, and they were to um, answer the question with a rating between one and five. Uh, you know, one being the least and five being the greatest of your feelings towards the question. One of the questions was, is I sometimes try to understand friends better by looking, looking their pers, pers, per, 
perspective, looking at them and their perspective. I'm trying to do that. What, how, you know, you were rating that between one and five. Uh, I'm going to go one. I don't care less about my friend and what they think about this, what's going on. Another question was, I often, I often have tender and concerned feelings about, about less fortunate than me. Uh, rating that between one and five. Maybe you're thinking that the question right now to ask you that question. How, do, how would you rate yourself or rate, rate in what you think about people that are less fortunate than you? Another question was, fewer call themselves soft-hearted. Others' misfortune don't bother much. In that these questions were, there were several more questions, but in that research, it's still the, the, the drop in caring, 40% drop in caring for others is a dramatic. And to ask that question is, is this what God wants in us as followers of Jesus Christ? Because if it's affecting us and it's affecting them, where is our culture going to go? A selfie-centered world. So, how does technology cause this uh, I don't care attitude? How does, it, how does it affect us? Well, we're going to look at a couple ways here. Let's look at where we're more obsessed with ourselves. Do you kind of see that in, in the people that kind of on your Facebook or on your Twitter account? Do you see that it's all, you know, we're, we're obsessed with our, ourselves. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you look at... Uh, when, um, your Facebook account or your Twitter account, you see all the, the really the selfie centered world is like, you know, it's like this, you know, we even, we, we, we're so about ourselves that we even call it, this is my driving in my car selfie. Yeah, yeah, you see a lot of those. You see a lot of those. This one here, I just don't like this one. I just really just don't. I wish people would not do it, but I'm going to do it for you anyways. It's the duck face selfie. <laughs> yes, it's the duck face selfie. I, you know, I really don't like it. I, you know, I look at people and I say, that's corny looking. Well, don't do that. That's, that just don't look right, you know, like that. And then there's my hanging out with my best friend selfie. You know, we have some of those, you know. All right. And then, then there is my... My good preaching selfie, I took that one last week, you know, there's my good preaching selfie. But in that, there's many other titles of, we've got so many, I mean, you, there's so many other titles that I could put pictures of me and all this other stuff on there all day long, but I really just ain't got time for all that. Because there's a word from God that we, we, need, to, we need help. Because we're a selfie-centered world. I mean, there's the kissing somebody in a cool place selfie. There's the cuddling with my pet selfie. We got some of those with Jaden and, and the new cat we got. There's my silly, my silly face selfie and my serious face selfie. You know, and there's just so much more. But there's an 80% of our society, uh, social media, is, is user-directed related to that person. So when you go on somebody's Facebook, 80% is all about them. It's nothing about what's going on with someone else. It's not something that's, you know, it's about themselves. And that tells us a lot of, uh, of an issue that, you know, we, we kind of talked about it last week, is that, you know, that self thing that we always go there, it's kind of like the drug issue, you know. It hits that something in your brain. It's called that dopamine high, you know. It's the legal buzz that we're allowed to, to have, you know. That, but we keep going back to that, looking for that self Somebody likes me. Somebody cares about me. And what it does is it releases that dopamine in our, our system. And in that we get that legal, I feel good. I feel great. Now somebody cares about me, you know, and life's better. You know, and, and in that we're, we're just a selfie-centered world and it's causing us problem. So reason number two I want to look at is, is overwhelming exposure to suffering desensitizes us. It desensitizes us. You know, I mean, I remember back a long time ago when uh, Michael Jackson and the, a bunch of musicians got together and they made up a, we are the world, we are the, and they made this really cool song. It was a really good song. But then they put all the world problems of the starving people in the video. 
At the first time you watch the video, it's like, I like this song, but I ain't watching these starving kids with the bloated bellies. I just ain't going to watch that. It's just going to, it's getting on my nerves. It makes me want to have to dish into my pocket. And I really don't want to dish into my pocket to give to some kids starving in Africa. But then after watching it in a while and a couple years later, we just, we could watch it there and, and not even affect us. It's even the thought of, you know, at times that we're, we're scrolling through our Facebook and we're, you know, we're watching videos or we're reading really cool sayings, you know, and some really, and all of a sudden somebody says, my mom died today. Scroll right on past it. Not even a hesitation, oh, I'm sorry for that. Not even a pick up the phone and call them. Not even, I'm praying for you. Even followers of Jesus Christ is getting less and less because the pain of it is we're being desensitized from it. Reason number three we look at is lack of personal interaction makes, us, makes it easier not to care. When we're not getting involved, that's why the churches are so empty and that's why people are caring less. It's what makes people care is when they start coming together as a group and they start seeing each other and it's like, you know, you, you see a couple, you know, people standing over in the corner and they're crying and hands are being laid on each other because why one person is unloading their cares and the other one's feeling the sorrow, and feeling the, the empathy of it. And in that they feel led to pray for them or hug them or care for them. We're not seeing that anymore. Once you would scroll through your your your. Facebook or your Twitter account and you see that I lost my job it's like I'm sorry to hear that and scroll on by oh that's a cool video but let me tell you if you sat down face to face with that person they're there at your table or you went to meet them at McDonald's to sit down and talk to them and all of a sudden they look you dead in the eyes and said I don't know what I'm going to do I lost my job today how much more the looking into the eyes and feeling the brokenness in their heart is going to affect your behavior. Within a moment, I mean, how many times up here standing and before even church even comes, you know that people all of a sudden they just got to, they, uh, they need prayer or they need a, they give a word of testimony and the tears that are coming out of their eyes all of a sudden, it's, it's like an epidemic. Everyone here has got tears falling, falling out of their eyes. And you can feel the pain in my heart, you know, and it's like the only help is God. But if we don't come to church or we don't get involved in people's lives or we don't, you know, see eye to eye. You know, it's made a difference in my life is some things have happened in my life that things have happened. And I'm praying, God, I was like, God, I just don't want this in my life. Get it out. It's a distraction. I don't need it. I don't need them. I don't need the problems. I got too much other big things to do. And God says, no, 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 it stays. And then that he's taught me about having compassion. Because I was on the other side of this. I was the one that was, it was breaking me. That I was like, I don't really care. I, I just don't, you know what? I'm sorry for them. That's their fault. They made the choice and they should have known better. They're grown up. I mean, look, I had, to take, I had to suffer what I went through because I made bad choices. Was, do you think anybody was there for me? I mean, I remember my mom trying to make some, you know, my dad had to work, but I remember my mom trying to make some ways to come down here and see me, but it was hard for her because she had her own life to live. And that's a lot of times what we're thinking. I have my own life to live. Who cares? I ain't got time for all that. I'm sorry what you're going through. Technology has put us into a position is that we just don't care about people and what they're going through. Because you know why? It's a mess. It's heartaching. It gives us stress. And we don't want that. So why should we get involved? It's just easier to just get on the phone, scroll by and say, mm, let me say a little prayer for him. Jesus, help him. Please, Jesus, help him. And move on about our lives. We as a culture have become so selfish and so uncaring. It's easier to ignore suffering from a distance. It is. So, true compassion demands, it demands action. 
This word is a way that this compassion in the original language, it's used in some of uh, Jesus' explanations of some of his stories. This word is called, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm trying not to butcher it, splagnizohi, something like that. I don't know. It's really splagna, that's the real, that's the, I uh, forget it. I'm just moving on. What's the definition of this word, splagnozamahi? I <laughs> butchered it bad. It means, to have the bowels yearn, feel deep sympathy, to be moved to action. Now, what really kind of got me was this is the bowels to yearn. Now, I don't know, I can read, I kind of just think about how do you describe the bowels to yearn? I can just think about the only thing that really comes to mind is that when you know somebody that's close to you and somebody close to them died and it's tearing them up and you're with them and you're just feeling the ache inside you so bad because you're feeling their pain. This is the word that is being used in the scriptures. We're going to read here in a little bit that Jesus felt towards people. Compassion. He felt this kind of compassion. So, to say you care but not act is to not care at all. For me to tell you this, if you're going to say you care, then you better back it up with action. Other than that, don't even mention the word you care. Just say, mm-hmm, okay, or something else. Because your, God's word is to tell us, let your yeses be yeses and your noes be noes. We are to be a people of who we are to say who we are. Don't say something and not mean it. Like if I was saying, I'm going to pray for you, I'm going to stop right there in the middle of Walmart or food line, and I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to pray for you again later on. But my first step is to do it right then and there. Ran into a pastor yesterday, a Pastor Marty Payton, and he's asking me some things, you know, and I was asking him how he's doing, and, you know, and he's like, well, I just want to let you know that we pray for you guys. And I was just like, Awesome. I was going to start crying right there. Because I pray for him. I pray for this church here. I pray for city revival. I pray for Crown Point. These are the churches that have been impacted in my life. I pray for Broadus. And to her, somebody... That's seeking God, who's preaching his heart out, and saying, I'm praying for you too. I didn't even want to go to Walmart yesterday. I wanted to do some other things, but I just like, no, I gotta go get this stuff. I gotta go get some light bulbs. I need to get this other stuff. It wouldn't have meant as much if it was on Facebook. But he looked me dead in the eyes. You see, it's amazing. When Jesus has compassion, things happen. Let me take you to some stories about Jesus' compassion and what he does. In Mark chapter 1. Verses 40 and 49. It's about this guy. He's a leper. He's a, he has leprosy. Verse 40. It says. A man with leprosy. Came and knelt. In front of Jesus. Beginning to be. Begging. Begging to be healed. If you are willing. You can heal me. And make me clean. He said. Moved with compassion. Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing. He said. Be healed. 
This is that word. This is that word. Splag, splagnosium or whatever that word is. It's, from the, it's that yearning inside him that he wanted to touch him and heal him. And I know some of you are going to be even, you're watching now, and, and I know some of you are going through some issues, and that's my heart's desire, is that God heal you. You come to my house or come here, man, I want to lay my hands and pray for you, look you in the eyes and, and know you're suffering, and know that, that it would be, the intensity of the, the prayer would be even greater, sort of like this, this, this leopard, he's begging, I know God you can heal, he's begging. And I know some of you have been begging God for something. But look him in the face and have that relationship and just say, God, please, I know you can heal me. I know you can do this. Will you? Will you? There's another story in, in, uh, in Matthew. Jesus and them come off of a boat. They're, they're coming off of a boat. Uh, they're come, traveling from somewhere and they get off of this boat. And so when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Then there was in verse in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, it says, it says and then uh, Jesus had compassion on, the, on them and touched their eyes. This is with a bunch of blind, this, this blind guy that was there. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. You see, this compassion, this compassion that God is, is wanting us to have, is that it calls for action in our lives. Some of you are full of compassion, but I'm, this, this, this message is more to warn you to be careful of what can happen. But some of us have lost our compassion. See, the more I obsess over social media, the more I care about me and the less I care about people. But the more I get closer, I get to Jesus, the less I care about me and the more I care about people. So what does, so what does compassion do? Let me tell you, the research of what compassion does it's a, it's a no wonder if people don't want to have it. You know what compassion does? Compassion interrupts. <laughs> compassion interrupts our lives. In, in Mark, it, it, there's, a, there's a, 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 a child in chapter 6, Mark chapter 6, it's talking about that, that Jesus and the disciples were doing, they were doing ministry and they were out there. And even Jesus himself it says, hey, let's go take a break. Let's have a, let's, let's just ha take some rest time. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this group of people come and just show up. And even Jesus is saying, listen, we need some rest. We need to go take some, you know, get over there. How many of you ever been in life and you're just like, I just want to go home. I want to sit down. I want to rest. And all of a sudden, these people come and they just start surrounding him. And you know what he does? He has compassion on them. And he sat down and he taught them some more. And he prayed with them and he healed them. And he just got back involved in their lives. In, in, in verse 8, you know, in, in Luke chapter 8, he, he even talks about this, this, this death. He's supposed to, this person was really sick. This, and he was going to, the, to visit, to heal this little girl. And all of a sudden, this other person tugs on his, on his coat. Who'd been sick for 12 years, had this issue of blood for 12 years. And he turns around and he takes some time out of where his mission was to, to take care of this dying little girl. And he gets involved with this other person. And she gets healed. Because of his compassion for her. Then there was a time in, in Mark chapter 2. He's preaching in, in this house. And the house is slapped full of people. In fact, people are outside standing around the house. And these guys, they have this in them. You know what? My buddy's sick and he's on this stretcher. And, and he, needs, he, he needs healed. And the only way is Jesus. And there's like, how we get him in there? And they come up there and they jump up on the roof and they start busting the roof open. And they lowered the guy down inside there and Jesus stopped preaching and said, you know what? I'm going to take care of this guy right here. He stopped what he was doing. Compassion interrupts. 
time after time I could remember. I got stories after stories, but the one that God just keeps laying on my heart is at the time I'm, I had a rough week at work. And, you know, and that day was a t- really, it was a, a very intense day. My brain felt like it was mush. And I pull up in my driveway, and there's another car. I don't recognize the car. And all of a sudden, I look up there, and there's Sissy sitting with somebody. And I was like, Lord, help me. And it's a man I haven't seen in a long time. And, and I just, hey, how you doing? And I said his name, and I walked right in the house. And I'm just like, I could just keep on going, and I could sit down, and I could just ignore him. It's, it, that's what went through my head. But in that, I was like, no, take a deep breath. Lord, I need your help. I, I, I don't even know what, I, don't, I know this is not good. Because it's always like that. And I go outside, and I sit down there, and then Sissy does how she does. Her, it's like our, our high five, it's your turn <laughs> type of deal. She's so cool, and how she does it, she's got, so, such, she's got such good couth <laughs> on how she hands it off. And then she goes in and she goes in the house and the next thing you know, he's spilling his guts. His marriage is a wreck. He's a wreck. And my heart started breaking because he's looking me in the eyes and his eyes are watering up. But with all the compassion that, that I have, I was like, I don't know what to tell him. But all I could say was, look, man, all I know what to do is just pray and ask God to help. At that one, that was the right thing to say. But that wasn't the first time. It was several times that he'd come and visit. He would go for a span a couple weeks. The next thing you know, I'd pull up there. And I was like, man, I just got so much to do. I got to do this. I got to go here. I got to take care of this. Or I just want to sit down and let my brain rest for a little bit. But I sit down and I listen to him. And I'm glad. Because then later, after months, he comes back. He says, I think my marriage is wanting to, it's wanting to turn around. I think she wants to work it out. Where before, it was over. It was divorce. It was this. It was, it was I'm killing them. <laughs> it was bad. It was scary. Bad. But that interruption... Now God is involved. God is turning it around. And it's looking like they're going to they're gonna have a rough road a little bit because there's going to be some trust issues. There's going to be some things they got to work out. But it's the idea that you got to take some time and say, this is a God interruption. Whoop, whoop. you got to recognize that. Another thing that compassion does, compassion costs. Compassion cost. You take the story of the Good Samaritan and how he was just traveling down his road. He's just doing his, probably his job. And he sees this guy all beat up on the side of the road. And he helps the guy up on his donkey and he takes him to the next hotel. And he said, listen, I need you to help take care of this. And the guy's like, well, that's going to cost money. He's like, well, all I have is my two days of wages is all I have right now. Two days of his earnings, he puts out for a total stranger to take care of a total stranger. He says, and I'll I'll stop by back next week and I'll pay anything else that is owed towards his bill. Compassion costs you. It's going to cost you your time. It's going to cost you some finances. It's going to cost you some energy. It might even cost you some trips to the doctor for some stress medicine. I don't know. But what I know is compassion costs you. Cost me some. I'm standing in line at the food line. Lady's got a buggy full of groceries. She starts going, I mean, just frantic and frantic and going through her wallet. Can't find her card. Has no cash. And she's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I hear that little voice. Sometimes that voice, mm, mm, no disrespect, says pay for it. All of a sudden, it just like, 
cashier's going, what? The other lady's going, what? And it's like, God said take care of this. Pay for it. Here. Done. Here's my, in fact, here's my food line card to get a discount on that, on that thing. When you're standing beside somebody and you're feeling the pain, then God speaks. You listen and then you obey. It's going to cost you. Then it changes lives. It changes lives. Story after story of Jesus and his compassion changed lives. I think of a woman over 30 years ago. They say almost, let's see, I would be young, 10, maybe 10, 40 years ago. She had a thing that was called Good News Club. It was kind of like vacation Bible school, but it was for your house. And you invited the kids in the neighborhood to come to this thing so that you would teach them about Jesus. But it happened all week because it, it would be done during, um, during the summer vacation. And it would give the kids something to do and get them out of mom and dad's hair for a little bit or whatever, mom's hair, you know, for a little bit. And they would teach them about Jesus. Years later, one of the girls hooks up with the lady who was teaching that and really spilt her guts about how that changed her life. Spilled her guts about how what was she was going through in her family and it was horrific. Horrific. And in that day, those, in that week, Jesus was introduced to her life and changed her life forever. Changed her life forever. But how much it will change your life if you get involved with somebody? Well, I remember the times that, that we got in, you know, when we got into the foster care system. Lord, did that change my life. Changed my wife's life more than anything. She had to put up with more of them kids. I got at least a break to go to work 10, 12 hours a day. But she would come home to them kids. And they had some luggage. It wasn't baggage. It was luggage. Of problems and problems and issues. It changed our lives. Some of them it changed theirs. I hope all of them. One, th one day. But compassion. Compassion will change your life. To care about, to care and not to act is not to care at all. As we get ready to close, I just want to put this in your heart of thinking, is technology interfering with your, compa your compassion with others? Is technology desensitizing you that when you're scrolling by, your heart is not even affected by, oh, I lost my job, or my parents died, or my so-and-so died, or, or I was just in a wreck. Or, do, 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 to stop and pray and mean the prayer, or to stop and say a private message, or something, to, be, to have compassion with somebody. See, the closer you get to Jesus, the more you're going to care. The closer you're going to get to Jesus, the more you're going to care. For others. Hashtag difficulties. To have compassion. Is going to bring you difficulties. But see following Jesus in a selfie centered world. Is hard. We need to recognize and understand where are we. With our compassion for Jesus and for others. You bow your heads. still is, to those who are even watching online or to hear, it still comes back to the first thing, to have compassion is to understand Jesus had compassion for you. That he died on the cross for your sins and was buried in a grave. And three days later, God raised him from the dead. 
so that we could have salvation. He had compassion to take the beatings and the nails and die for you. So that one day, when your life is over, you'll have the choice to go to heaven. He had compassion and he thought about you. But it's your choice. Will you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? As we pray, will you repent of your sins and ask Jesus to save you? For the rest of us that are followers of Jesus Christ, I challenge you to ask God and Jesus to put compassion in your heart like Jesus. Fair warning. The heartache. The brokenness that's going to come with it. But you see, Jesus already, he knows it. He's already lived it for you, for me. As we pray, will you seek God and Jesus? Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus to thank you for this day. We stand on your holy word of Isaiah that this word will go forth and it will accomplish the things we are unto it is sent. Father God, we just pray now for those that do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Many watch online and many just say they're Christians, but their behavior and their actions are contradicting. There's no fruit of salvation. Today, may Holy Spirit, you come upon them, bring conviction and salvation right now. May they just stop the video and repent and ask Jesus to save them right now so that the fruit will be seen and the compassion will come forth and they will have a, a, a yearning and a heartache and a, an, a, an ability to think about how many people around them are going to die and go to hell because of not knowing Jesus Christ. That should be our first compassion for all around us. Help us have that compassion. Help on point as a church, as the people here have compassion for the people around us that are going to die and go to hell. Father, we just ask your hand to be with us. This week, as we come up on Thanksgiving, God, Father God, we just ask your blessing upon uh, this day of remembrance. Thank you for a country that still allows us to come to church and honor you and worship you and pray and listen to some, some words that change our lives. We thank you for our families. We thank you for our jobs and the things that go with our household, our cars and things like that. We thank you for giving us clothes and health some of them are still battling with the health issues we ask your healing there may you turn what is meant evil and sickness and heartache may you turn it to good god we love you i bless these people in the name of jesus with your love and your compassion that this week they will see what you see they will feel what you feel in jesus christ's holy name amen